Right, so uh, on this special Let's Talk Trek, folks, we've got a, a great treat in store for you. Uh, so as usual, there's me here, Carl, from Trekkie's Guide. Over on this side, we have Dan from Trekkie's Guide. Down Hi, here, we have James from The Riker's Beard. And uh, there, we have Sir Richard, also from The Riker's Beard. And as I mentioned, we've got a, a huge treat in store for you today. So uh, recently... You will all be aware this amazing book has been released. Uh, we've all been hard at work getting through it. Not that it's been hard work. It's been extremely pleasurable reading this. And we're fortunate enough to be talking to the author of The Dark Veil today. He is BAFTA nominated. He is the award-winning New York Times, Sunday Times, Amazon number one best-selling author. And I understand as well the first British writer to have not just one but two of his story ideas make it to screen in Star Trek Voyager seasons four and six. So, gentlemen, it's my privilege to introduce to you Mr. James Swallow. Hey, everybody. Hi, James. Thanks very much for, for inviting me on. It's, it's, it's really great to be here. I uh, really appreciate it. No, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for making the time for us. Right, All right. Uh, our understanding is for this interview that Carl, you're going to chair it and sort of filter the questions through, and we're basically just going to grill you for everything we can, James, um, and get as much as yeah. possible. Which I, to be honest with you, having looked at your back catalogue, this must be precious time because literally all you do is eat, sleep, and write. Do you even sleep? Because no. so much stuff, it's incredible. Yeah, but you know, I, I have a stasis chamber. I can pack all my sleep into like twenty minutes. No, I wish I could do that. <laughs> so, what I what I tend to do is I stay up very very late playing video games until I fall asleep in front of the console. So you know, that's um, that's kind of like my sleep pattern these days. <laughs> Let me ask you a directly relevant question then, James. Sci-fi, uh, because of the the sort of job I do, I've always seen as escapism, and it's mm. a way to get away from the nitty gritty and the trauma of real life into a world that might exist elsewhere. Is that what attracts you to it? Um, I don't know. I mean, one thing I always liked about writing science fiction is, is what I always talk of is like the funhouse mirror effect. Star Trek's really good for this actually is, is where you can, you can talk about real world issues, but you go, Oh, but it's, it's people with a funny, funny thing on their face and they're from another planet. So doesn't appeal to us so you can tackle you can talk about like you know sensitive issues you can talk about war and religion and politics and racism and sexism all that kind of stuff the kind of hot button stuff that people might not go oh i don't want to have a conversation about that but then you say well let's couch it in terms and now we're talking about green people and blue people instead of black people and white people and suddenly it's like oh okay we can have a conversation about this and i've always liked that uh, ability to just sort of like the the show and to sci-fi in general to hold up a mirror to the real world and you can look at things and you go, well, maybe you can fold that back into your real life experience. So you can kind of sneakily, stealthily put ideas into people's minds and then maybe have them apply them to, to, the, to their actual lived experience. So you can talk about a taboo subject, if you like, without running risk of offending anyone and have the conversation. Yeah, because sometimes, you know, people will find it difficult to sort of address that stuff head on. And, you know, you, you give them the opportunity to kind of consider it and ruminate on it in, in a very different way. I mean, I got I got that from the, the Voyager episodes that you were involved in, like Memorial. How you know the past shouldn't just be swept away. You know, it, even, no matter how bad it is, it should be remembered. You know, yeah, that was, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very much that was like um, that was a that's a key theme of that episode. You know, in the story, it's about it's about a war memorial, um, and and those are things that um, as a kid, I've always I was really fascinated by the kind of the 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 the, the shape and the kind of the the atmosphere and the energy around sort of a war memorial, you know, we had them all, play, all over the place in London. And I would see these things as a kid, you know, these lists of names for people who I would never know, who had, who had gone off and done these like terrible things and, you know, been gone through these terrible situations. And, and this was the only sort of trace of these people that was left for everybody else to sort of like hear about. And I remember thinking to myself, being really, really struck at a very early age about like, what does this mean? And you know what? What what is this memorialising? What is the experience that was had here? And you and you, but you never get to kind of connect to it wholly because it's generations past, you know. So I, 
at being a science fiction writer, you know, I, I kind of took that idea on. I thought, well, if it was a science fiction idea, perhaps you would have a war memorial where you could experience what actually happened in a more direct way. And that's the, the plot of the story is that the, the crew of Voyager, they start having these flashbacks to a war which they were never in. And they're experiencing these events that, are, that they've never had, they've never actually taken part in. And as the story goes on, they gradually figure out that what it is, is it's this war memorial is broadcasting the memories of this terrible traumatic event, but it's malfunctioning. So the kind of, the, the, there should be like a bit at the beginning that says, this is, you know, this is a recollection of these events, but that doesn't happen. So they have this traumatic experience and eventually they find that the war memorial is malfunctioning and they have the chance to, to switch it off or to fix it. And at the end of the story, Janeway says, we have to fix it because this is very important, because even though it isn't our war and it's not our people, this is important to somebody. And this this must be memorialized, it must be remembered. So they fix the device and then and then they go they go on their way. But that came from that, that sort of very real experience there of something that I'd seen in my youth. Um, and that's something that is, you know, obviously is, is still around today. You know, we're at a point now where the, the last generation that experienced the Second World War are, are dying off. And when those guys and girls are gone, who's going to remember all the things that took place? It's important for us to, to keep that memory alive in the generations that follow. I can't remember the exact dialogue, but I'm sure Janeway makes the point that in actual fact, their own existence has been enriched by living through it as well. It's made them a bit more really realised about their own mortality from having done it. So it's... A wonderful yeah. episode, one of my favourites. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, and I think the other the other great thing about uh, Trek episodes as well is, and particularly with the other episode you were involved in, one, um, is how the themes recur. I mean, that one's extreme. Considering when it was made, that one's extremely relevant to the situation we find ourselves in today, isn't it? You know, with the isolation. Yeah, I suppose it is. Yeah. From so many people, and it, it's amazing how you can relate to these things so long afterwards with events that come around again. You make a really good point there. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, you're right. I mean, um, <laughs> it's funny the the evolution of that idea. Um, actually, it was quite uh, quite callously engineered by me, to be honest. <laughs> this is right back at the very beginning of my career, and um, I was trying to find an idea that I could sell to the show. Uh, and the the thing that always works is if you can sell them an idea, they can do cheaply, because. <laughs> TV shows, you know, cost a lot of money to make TV shows, especially back then when it was like 22 episodes of, of Star Trek being produced a year. They're making one episode of the TV show every year and they have a few crowd pleaser episodes they're going to do where they have a big budget and they roll out the guest stars and they do a lot of special effects, you know. And so they spend all the money on them. So they're always looking, can we do a cool story that won't cost a lot of money to do? So in the back of my head, I was thinking, how can I do a story that doesn't cost a lot? I'll write a story where most of the cast aren't even in it. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so that was the kind of the idea. It's like, how could I write this story that was very close focus, very sort of on a small sort of level? And originally the story, uh, it's about Seven of Nine, the, um, the the episode that was produced, but the original pitch, she wasn't even in it because it was, it was actually pitched before Seven joined the crew and it was just going to be about the Doctor on the ship by himself. Oh, okay. But as the, uh, when we pitched it, it was just as Seven was being introduced into the show and they were writing up her backstory and they were figuring out how they were going to, how they were going to work her into the show. Uh, and uh, the producer said to me, well, this is what we want to do. We want to introduce this other character and we want to make it about the two of them. And that adds a whole different dynamic on it, especially because Seven is a member of the Borg Collective and she's never really been alone in her entire life because she's always been part of this collective group. She's always had voices in her head. She's always had company in some way. And so when she's in this situation where she has to pilot Voyager almost on her own, she starts to kind of come apart at the seams because she's not used to it. So it's very much a, it's a study of loneliness about the way that isolation affects people. And I guess, you know, Carl, you're right there. You, you could definitely sort of fold that back into the events that we're happening right now, because I'm sure there are plenty of people out mm. in the real world right now who are feeling isolated and lonely and maybe sort of like, you know, fraying a little bit at the seams. I know certainly it's been hard pressed for me. So, yeah, I mean, that's, like I say, the great thing about Star Trek is we can sort of, reflect real, real world issues for people and hopefully in the in the context of an entertaining story you can also say well you know maybe this will help you understand your own circumstances a little better i mean it's obvious that you're a a massive star trek fan yourself um you know you've got 
what, 14? My calendar, I've got my scratcher calendar on the wall. There's the base behind. behind you there. It's a, <laughs> and uh, you've, you've got to believe, is it about 14 Star Trek books to your name? And with the release of The Dark Veil, I, I could be wrong, but I think that puts you in a quite a unique position of being the, the only writer that's covered literally everything that's non-animated anyway, from characters from TOS all the way through to Discovery and Picard. I haven't quite collect, I, I would like to do that, you know, like collect the set, you know, tick every mm. box. I haven't quite done that yet because um, I've yes, never read a story about the Enterprise crew from, yeah, like the NXO one Enterprise. And I um, haven't done, I haven't done the Kelvin timeline. Mm. But I would love to do that. I would love to be able to do every Trek crew, yeah. every box. So, you know, who knows, maybe in the future. I mean, I've, I've pitched a couple of ideas for both those. Um, both those Star Trek elements, but, you know, never kind of got off the ground. What's it like being a, a Trekkie and actually knowing that you've made a contribution to, you know, the construction of that universe? It's awesome. I mean, it's really... I mean, <laughs> Let's face it, that's what, that's what we all want a hand in at some level. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, uh, I mean I, I, like I, I always say to people whenever I do a podcast, I say, let me tell you my origin story, my, star, my Trek nerd origin story. And that was 1980s Star Trek... Um, the original series airing on BBC TV, BBC Two, and me rushing home from school to watch it. And that's my kind of, that's my first fandom. That's the sort of the, the first TV Star Trek, TV sci-fi that I think I really seriously got into that, you know, I started not just watching the shows, but I was I was reading about it and I was finding the books and the, you know, the, the James Blish novelizations and all the, the making of books and the Star Trek technical manual, you know, all that kind of stuff. This is the first science fiction show I think that really kind of, spoke to me that I discovered you know myself and so years later being able to contribute something to that world I feel like I'm giving something back because I've got I've got so much enjoyment out of watching all of the Star Treks over the years and not just from being entertained but also when I got involved in Star Trek fandom you know I, I went to conventions I, I was like uh, I helped to run a, a Star Trek fan club back in the 80s you know, uh, as I said, you know, uh, I met my partner at a Star Trek convention. I met a lot of great friends at a Star Trek conventions, people who I still keep in contact with to this day. So Star Trek's actually given me a lot in my life, not just for uh, as somebody who's been entertained by it, but also personally and professionally, Star Trek's been really good to me. And, and now you've, you've reached the pinnacle and you've met us and you're on Let's Go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, this is the... This is the cap. This is the end cap, you know. But it's really great. It's really great to be able to, as a, as somebody who's a creative, as a writer, be able to say, I can look at that, that massive sort of patchwork quilt that is Star Trek, all the you know thousands of stories that have been created by different people in different ways that have all been stitched together cr to create this huge version of, of what we think of as Star Trek, and just being able to say, I want to just add a little piece to that, you know, mm -hmm. just put an extra sort of bit in there. That is that is really great. Because, like I said, I feel like I'm kind of giving back to, to something that's meant a lot to me over the years. James, could I ask you, when you're um, writing either a screenplay or, or a novel or, or whatever, um, what, is, what is the resource that you're starting from? Because obviously you've got your own knowledge of the franchise. Um, do you have a brief that says to you, we want your story to get from point A to point B, or wherever you start and wherever you end, you must cover A, B, C and D? Do you get given some sort of background document that, that you work from? What, what do you have? Yes, all of those. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it varies. Um, sometimes... I just, uh, just to interrupt quick, we are going to talk about the, the Dark Veil. That's what we really want to do. I think it's only fair to warn our viewer um, when this goes out. This, is, this will contain spoilers, and we're absolutely desperate to, to talk about it. Um, we've all read it. We've all thoroughly enjoyed it, and we we'll can't give a, picking we'll give you a spoiler warning when we when we when we start getting into the into the yeah. sort of nitty gritty of it. But to, to to James, to go back to your point, um, yeah. So sometimes um, editorial will say we'd like you to write a book. What would you like to write? So, um, for example, if you go back a few years to uh, a TOS novel, original series novel I did called The Latter Fire, um, my editor came to me and she said, "Do you want?" We want you to do a book. What do you fancy doing? And I said, I'd really love to do a TOS novel. Okay, off you go. Do what you like. And I was pretty much given a blank slate. 
Whereas with uh, the Picard novel that I've just done, the Dark Vow, and previously the Discovery novel that I did, the the Fear itself, mm-hmm. with that, um, they came to me and they said we want you to do a novel for this series, and we want it to be about these characters, but the story you tell is up to you, but it has to be about these characters in this kind of situation. Uh, I'm currently working on a new Star Trek project right now, which hasn't been announced, which is at the other end of the spectrum where we have a very, very distinct brief and we have to write about this kind of story and it has to involve these characters and there's a lot of backstory and a lot of, I wouldn't say restrictions, but there's a lot of kind of boxes to tick about the story that we have to tell. So there is no one answer to your question. It, It can vary. It depends on the needs of the, the the line at the time. You know, the editorial team may say like, oh, you know, we haven't done a TNG novel for a while. Let's do a TNG novel. Jim, could you do that for us? Or they might just say, we have a gap in the schedule. Fill it with whatever you like. Or they might have a specific thing they want to do. They say like, oh, you know, Picard has just come out. Let's do two Picard novels. And they'll commission two different writers to do that. So it varies from, from basically project to project, from um, schedule to schedule. Well, let, let me... Uh journey down the rabbit hole with you then um because i've flagged my copy with bits i was going to pick up on um, you the <laughs> this is where this is where you can put up the spoiler warning carl um, okay. so the scientist vadrell um if, if that's your pronunciation of him who's on the warbird the romulan warbird uh, who's obviously in a second life of some kind. Um, and he's described, isn't he, part of an elite cadre of thinkers who crossed the limits of what was possible while other scientists have wrung their hands and bleated about ethics and accountability. At this point, my ears prick up. and go, hello, what's he, what's he up to? And then later on, duh, 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 yes, he's commenting on uh, the energy core from the Jazari vessel. And uh, he says, yes, tetrions, incredibly incredibly powerful particles in the right quantities, a highly potent stellar inhibitor. And then on the following page, you talk about the Tal Shiar have long suspected that star death is not a natural phenomenon. And Mm -hmm. suddenly all the pieces start dropping into place about the Romulan star. What are you working from? I couldn't possibly comment. (laughs) (laughs) a huge part of canon that, that you you've just alluded to and you've given us these subtle clues and, and there they are and gone, bing you know yeah. he, he must have got some sort of, of, of background brief saying this needs to be in is that so i can neither confirm nor deny <laughs> <laughs> i knew it i knew it There's, all right so let we, me do the question another way did you or did you not know uh, <laughs> You can't handle the truth. Um, <laughs> Did you order the code red? <laughs> part of the um, part of the, the work that we've done in certainly working on the Picard novels and the Discovery novels is we've had uh, a really great interrelationship with the production team over over at Paramount. With previous Star Trek um, books related to TV shows, there hasn't been the sort of the open door. It's pretty much been kind of one way. It's like, well, if it happens on the TV show. You have to, you know, you have to follow that line and, and that's all there is to it. But now the door is kind of swinging both ways a little bit, mostly because one of the executive producers and writers on the shows right now is Kirsten Beyer, who is formerly a Star Trek novelist, has written a bunch of really great Star Trek Voyager novels. And she's kind of basically been promoted upstairs to the Admiralty to actually work on the show, as it were. And because Kirsten understands the needs of the novels and the needs of the TV show, she is the kind of bridge between the two. So when I was working on the the, the, the uh, uh, Discovery novel, I had a close relationship with her and we got to work on uh, you know that very, very closely. And when the show was being made, I was being sent. It was, it was great, actually. It was like every morning I would turn on my computer and I would have the day's photography, production photography from the episode of Discovery that was being shot that day. And I would be getting new drafts of the scripts being sent through to me. And so every morning I'd be like, wow, this is really cool. Wow, that looks really awesome. And I'm reading the new scripts. And of course, I couldn't talk to anybody about it. Mm. And for about the course of a year, I had to be absolutely, totally mum about the whole thing. And I would go online to Trek BBS or or some of the other bulletin boards. And I would see people talking about all the, I've heard this true rumor. This is what's happening on Star Trek. It's going to be no, 
No, no, no, it's not that at all. It's, you're completely, you're not even close to being wrong. You're beyond wrong. If there's a thing beyond wrong, that's where you are. And then the same thing happened uh, with the Picard show is I got to see, you know, um, all of the production and, and everything that was taking place at the same time. So because we had this interrelationship, it meant that small details, stuff that will pay off in season two of Picard or further on that might pay off in other TV shows, we could suddenly have that conversation where we could say, make this reference, suggest this detail, but don't kind of color in all the bits, you know, just say, well, maybe, maybe this happened. Well, we'll see. And then that might pay off later on in a TV episode, or it might pay off later on in, in a novel. What we're doing is we're trying to create a sense that all these things are properly connected, that yeah. you feel that they don't exist in isolation. You know, the book is part of the continuity of the TV show. You know, the, the TV show is free to kind of overwrite that at some point in the future, of course, because the TV show is what leads and the books are what follow. But we work as hard as we can to kind of make sure that everything is moving as closely as possible and that all of the narrative elements connect up. So when you read something like that, that is in there deliberately. And that is there alluding to something that may pay out later on. Yeah. That may, I like that, may play out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An issue, isn't there, with, with some of the Trek novels? I've, I've read hundreds and hundreds of them over the years. And, you know, when we had no Trek on TV, we mm. had lots of, of literary com uh, content coming out. And therefore, you could follow what happened to the characters from TNG and Voyager and, and Deep Space Nine on through years. And as, as sometimes happens, the TV show comes back into production and then sort of overwrites a lot of the canon that I say canon, I know, you know, secondary canon, uh, a lot of the canon that's been established. So one of my favorite books is the Destiny trilogy, because it's, you've got everybody thrown into that. And that effectively, I, I presume now, is out of continuity because it doesn't fit with what we now know about Picard and so forth. Absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, the, um, my, my colleague Dave Mack's Destiny trilogy destroys the Borg. The Borg are completely, you know, they are they are removed from the Star Trek universe at the end of that series. And it's a great set of books and it's really exciting stuff. And like you say, everybody and their dog is in that. And it's just like, it's, it's the, it's the all-star team up Star Trek story, you know, and it would make, man, if they could do that as a mini series or a movie, it would be incredible. But now Picard has come along and, you know, we see Borg in Picard and that is set in a time period after the time period of destiny. So it's like, well, the TV, like I said before, the TV show leads. Mm -hmm. So if they decide that's the way it's going to go, it's like, okay, well, you know, the books were always, as you say, a, a secondary continuity. They've always been serving at the pleasure of the television show. So if the show decides to go a different way, we have to roll with that as the writers. And that's just, a, that's simply the way it is. You know, it doesn't mean that suddenly those novels turn to dust and you can't read them anymore. You know, those books are still there. You can still read them. You can still enjoy them. I say to people who, who say to me, oh, well, you know, why should I bother reading it? So, because it's a great story. Yeah, brilliant just, stories. Just consider it as, you know, a, a different timeline, a different continuity, and just pick up the books and enjoy them because you will. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we had several very good long chats, including a couple of live where we, we tried to guess where the writers were taking Discovery Season 3. Um, some of our ideas, we were close, and some of our, our predictions were very, very yeah. far off. What were they called, the, the wiggly things? I, I, I had the impression, I was, I was hoping that the um, aliens from the TNG episode, Conspiracy, you know, the little... Oh, yeah, thing, yeah. I was like, oh, maybe they'll make an appearance because they relayed a message and it's going to take a thousand years to get back home. And it was, I was like, no, I'm completely wrong. But I was like... It, it, as, as a writer, though, do you find it easier with, for instance, you know, a, a part of Trek where w the public don't know that that bit like discovery, there's lots still to learn. Or when you when you have a TNG episode, we all know everyone is going to survive. We all know that they're all going to be there in the end episode. So you can't really, you know, except for GR. Well, you, you can't kill anybody off, or you know, it, is it easier to write for one or the other? <laughs> I mean, well, you know, we've you know we have created one of the things we did in, in the book continuity is we created our own new characters or we brought back characters, you know, um, sort of side characters who might have turned up in one episode, and then we gave them, kind of fleshed them out and gave them a bit more life. Uh, and because we had a great degree of freedom, you know, we, we did kill off characters. We blew up Deep Space Nine in the novels. We utterly destroyed 
that space station and we built a brand new one because we could because we had that degree of freedom you know um in the you know in the novels we have our own continuity so we we were all working together as as you know, different writers writing different books are all setting around about the same time period where we would be crossing over so the the star trek titan novels with Riker and troy on their own starship the deep space nine novels continuing on like the eighth and ninth season of star trek the voyager novels where the voyager crew go back to the delta quadrant on an exploratory mission um, and you know all the, the the Gorkon novels that were set in the Klingon Empire, the Starfleet Corps of Engineers novels, all of these things. We tried to make them kind of mesh together as best we could. So, if you were somebody who reads a lot of Star Trek books, you pick up a novel, and it would refer to something in a different book. That if you picked up that other book, it'd be oh, you know, there's a direct continuity here, a direct connection. And do you have a favorite type of Trek to write for? Uh, what, what 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 is your favorite of the Star Trek? Oh, that's a good question. And I say it's that's it's a really hard question to answer because they all have they all appeal to me in different ways. Some of them, some of them are more challenging than others. Uh, I remember when I, I did a, a Next Generation um, uh, ebook novella called "The Stuff of Dreams," which is a Picard story, and I wrote that because I couldn't really get on with writing Picard. I couldn't do it. I couldn't write him well. I found it very difficult to kind of get into his head. And I thought, I want to test myself to see if, can I write a decent Picard story? So I took that on because, not because I found it easy, but because I found it hard. Um, and I had a lot of fun doing that. You know, I've, I've written I've written the TOS era stuff. I really had an absolute ball doing that because to me, like I said earlier, that's my first fandom. And I did that kind of bold, brassy, loud, in your face, you know, stuff blowing up kind of, almost like the, in, the, in the space between the end of the, the TOS series and the beginning of the animated series. So it's very kind of four color and larger than life, you know, and I had a lot of fun doing that. Um, but I've also had a lot of fun doing the Titan novels with Riker and Troy, who are my, my favorite Star Trek couple. And, and Riker's definitely my favorite TNG character. Uh, and I really enjoyed uh, just doing stories with them because those felt like the kind of the sensibilities of the original series with that kind of boldly going strange new worlds kind of thing, but in the TNG time period. So we got to kind of have the best of both worlds with that. Pardon the pun. Hmm. And it's been what, probably five years since your last Titan novel? Yeah, I think that would um, technically my last Titan novel would have been the, the poison chalice, which was part of the four mini series. Uh, and of course the, uh, the Dark Veil is a Picard novel, but it's also about the Titan crew. So it's mm. it's kind of but it's it's kind of one, but it's both. Yeah, oh, and it, just turn obviously up in the Dark Veil. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, in the Dark Veil, you're referencing characters that you've written before. You're referencing empires that we're all aware of with people like the Romulans, but you're also getting to create entirely new species like the Jazari. Mm. And you know what? Where do you start with something like that? Well, the thing is, the Jazari aren't a new species. No, that's that's well, part of the, that's part you of the. Did you call? Yeah, you read the book. They're, didn't you? they're, they're actually they're, they're actually part of. Uh, it's a it's a very sort of subtle twist. It's they're 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 because the the I mean spoiler alert we're going into full on spoiler territory. Yeah. So, the twist in the story is the Jazari don't exist. Is that they're actually a race of androids hmm. who have created this fiction this fictional species, so they can interact with the Federation and basically do it on their terms. So it's, it's this mask that they hide behind is, is, is what the Jazari really are. Underneath all of that, they're an android species. And if you remember your original series, they're, they're the, actually the android series from, um, from the episode I, Mud, of the original show. Do you remember the, you know, the, the, yes. the duplicates with yeah, the little thing? Yeah, with on, yeah. That's right, yeah. And some mud! Yep. There you go. Yeah. And and, uh, and that came from that idea I'd had kicking around for a while because I remember watching that episode and, you know, that episode's play for laughs and it's great jolly fun. And at the end of that episode, the androids basically have just had their brains confused and scrambled by the by our, by our logical human crew. Mm. And I thought to myself, what would they do after the Enterprise crew left? Is that You can imagine them going, well, that didn't work. What are we going to do now? We can't have that happen again. These kind of crazy, illogical beings, they'll, they'll mess us up. We have to figure out a way around it. So I came up with this idea that they would reinvent themselves. They would, you know, they would reprogram themselves and fix their software, upgrade their hardware and say, well, how can we make sure that that doesn't ever happen again? 
And that was the seed of the idea for the Jazari is that they are the same species. And there is a scene in the in the book where they they talk about their origins. And if you read between the lines, one of the, the, the forms they show is the android from from that episode. Yeah. But to answer your question um, about creating new species, that is mm. that is a, a, a new new elements for the for the Star Trek universe. Yeah, that is a key part uh, of writing these books. And the important thing I've always tried to to kind of cleave to is, does it feel like Star Trek? We know what to expect from Star Trek. We know what kind of stories we're going to get told there. So I always try to make sure that the the feel and the texture of those characters is true to the Star Trek era that they're part of. Does it does it give you more freedom now when you think about creating a character? Because presumably, um, wind back twenty years, if you're writing a story that's got a, a new alien, you've got to think they've got to be able to reproduce this on screen. Mm. Nowadays, because we we've got CGI and makeup so much better, does that give you more freedom as a writer to 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 have a more bizarre looking species that you can conjure up? We have done that a bit. Certainly in the Titan novels, we had some really wacky crazy species we had um i think we had like a, a giant lobster we had um we had a character that looked like, you know, like Dr. Um, we had uh we had a creature that looked like a like a lava lamp on legs i remember that was one description we talked about um you know kind of um creatures that were like a, a, a spacesuit full of gas like an intelligent gas living in a sort of capsule you know, but we could do all that kind of stuff because we we've got the best budget in the world, which is your brain. So you know, it, we don't have to worry about you know doing that on TV would cost millions and millions of dollars per episode to show that sort of stuff. But in the books, we could say, let's just go crazy. You know, let's come up with some really amazing creatures um, and bring bringing back you know lots of different Star Trek races that we're already familiar with uh, and inventing new ones. That's always a lot of fun. One of the things that um, I put into the Titan novels was something that I particularly like is I like, I like stories about artificial intelligence and the Star Trek. And in fact, actually, you know, the dark veil vale touches on that as well. Star Trek doesn't really have a very good record when it comes to AIs because they tend to be insane, murderous killer computers. And, and it's pretty much the only guys in the plus column is like data and everybody else is evil. And I thought that's really unfair. That's kind of, you know, that, that that's that's speciesist towards artificial intelligences. There must be decent, good AI species out there. So my first Titan novel, Synthesis, was exactly about that. It was about the Titan crew meeting a race of artificially intelligent synthetic life forms and how they connect with them and, and how their first contact with them proceeds forward. And, and designing that in my head was kind of creating these ideas of these ro spider-like robots so imagining these kind of like a giant sort of robot beetle, which would be impossible to do on television, would be kind of like something out of a Michael Bay movie, you know, like the Transformers, these huge, great big machine things. And I think doing that on a Star Trek budget would have been probably pretty difficult. But in a book, it's easy. So do you do you tend to go into the creative process of writing a book? Do you have two separate one, ones where potentially what you're writing, they may have to do on screen to tie in? And um, then you've got books that you're writing that, you know, there's no way that's ever going to be a movie or a TV series. Do you have two separate ways of writing in that respect? No, no, I've, I've, I've never sort of, I've never yeah. sat there and thought, oh, yeah. could they do this on TV? I just think like, no, you know, that, that's, that's never been a concern for me. It's always like, you know, the first thing I think of is, can I, can the reader conceive of this idea? Can you see it in your head? And if you can, then I'm going to write it. Cool, that's really encouraging to hear, actually. That's awesome. <laughs> now, one of the other things I noticed in the, the Dark Vale, as with a lot of Trek books, obviously, is lots of little Easter eggs. Some of my yeah, favourite, with yeah. things like, uh, for example, the uh, the reference back to Star Trek Insurrection. That's one of my favourite uh, Trek films. Uh, and there's, there's just little callbacks to things like characters from those films and other books, etc. And do you find it that your head's just sort of like bursting with these references that you want to get in there and you struggle to sort of like shoehorn them all in or does it is it sometimes a bit more difficult to actually find a way to get these references into the book? Well, it's with these sort of things, uh, it's kind of like, I always say, it's like using saffron. If you if you if if any of you guys cook, right? Mm -hmm. You use saffron in your cooking, a little goes a very long way, right? And, and that's kind of the way I feel about Easter eggs is that if you put a lot of these things in, people who don't get the joke kind of trip over them in the book and say, like, well, what does that mean? Why is he talking about this thing? I don't know what that means. 
and that draws that person out of the story. So the best way to do an Easter egg I found is if you put a reference in, if you're in the know and you get it, you'll be like, hey, that's cool. You know, oh, it's a nice little in joke. Whereas if you don't get it, it doesn't break the flow of your narrative. The the piece that you're talking about there, the reference to to Anisha and the Baku from uh, from Insurrection, I was writing the scene that you're talking about, which is Riker talking to Picard, yeah. and I was and I was rewatching. Um, I think it was like it's like the 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 horror channel are showing Star Trek, you know, every night of the week, and they were showing episodes of TNG. So I was watching them in the background while I was cooking my dinner, just to keep listening to Patrick Stewart's voice to remind myself the rhythm of how he talks. And, uh, and one week I turned on the TV and Insurrection was on TV on Sky Movies. And I thought, oh, I'll just watch a little bit of this. Uh, and it's not really my favorite movie, but it's got some nice Picard moments in it. Mm. And as I was watching it, I suddenly thought, yeah, you know, maybe I could just sort of fold something back into that. And so the moment, if you've seen that film, it has a resonance. But also, if you haven't seen that film, you understand that in that scene, Picard's talking about these characters saying to him, you know, you, you've, you've left Starfleet, you're sitting around on Earth, why don't you come and hang out with us? And Picard says, no, 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 I'm going to stay here because I'm a bit pissed off about everything and I'm still processing what I'm annoyed about. So even if you haven't seen that movie, you still get what's going through his mind because that's the most important thing in that scene is how does Picard feel? But if you've seen that movie, you get an additional level of understanding because you connect back to those experiences, because you can remember the experience that he's had. So you you kind of connect a little closer to it because you get the Easter egg. Mm. Other stuff, other references are kind of like just sort of small things, just the odd sort of, you know, I will name check stuff here and there if I can, just to make it feel connected. Uh, I remember early on, actually, one name check that I actually had to cut out was I was going to name check the USS Cerritos from Lower Decks, because when I was writing this, um, the show hadn't started. Lower Decks hadn't aired or anything. All we had was we didn't, there was no artwork for the ship or anything. I think they just released some character artwork and they talked about the name of the ship and the crew. And I didn't know anything else about it at all. And I wanted to write just I thought I'll just put a little nod to it because it's kind of like the there's, there's like a, I think it's the there's like a five year gap between season one of Lower Decks and when the Dark Veil is set. Right. So I wrote in a, a line of dialogue where a character was saying that they transferred onto the Titan from the Cerritos, just as a passing reference. Mm. Uh, and in the end, we talked about it and, um, and we basically decided to cut it out because we weren't sure if the Cerritos would, wouldn't get blown up by the end of the first season of Lower Decks. We didn't <laughs> want to look stupid. So we were, in the end, we just uh, we dropped that reference out, which is a shame, really. And it's kind of funny when you think about how you get to that last episode of Lower Decks and the Titan is in that episode yep. and Wemler transfers over. So, you know, <laughs> it's a shame. I feel like it's a bit of a missed opportunity there, but yeah. yeah. There you go. Should be another book. Yeah. 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 <laughs> By the way, that, that uh, reference back to Insurrection uh, and Anish back on the Baku planet, what Picard did there was he blew a definite shag. <laughs> think, you know, it's like, beautiful, wasn't it? It's like you know, it's like dude, you know, it's the, that the whole bit in that scene where where um he says, oh, you know, you go back to that planet. He's like, yeah, and you'll start aging backwards. Why would you not want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> why would you not want to? Do it's like, what are you thinking? Just go for crying out loud, you know. But um, but, no, <laughs> it's just, yeah, but he's you know the thing is he's at su he's at such a grumpy place. He's in such a bad mood. It's only a year after he's resigned from Starfleet. And he's still he's still very sore about it, you know. So he's he's still processing a lot of those emotions. Can so I just touch the, the, the book before I forget it? Because I got I got to this page last night, and um, yeah, where the Jazari because you, you've now disclosed, of course, the Jazari are androids masquerading uh, as uh, as a biological form, and they say at some point there never was a Jazari, no reptilian life form evolved on this planet, and that the character says. Now that the veil has been torn away, is that the source of the title? No, that's kind of I, I, I got the title um, right at the very beginning, and and then I kind of retroactively referenced it because there are there are some the the, the metaphorical dark veil. It actually comes from uh, a quote from Benjamin Disraeli, which oh. I I can't remember off the top of my head now, which is terrible. Um, but the the metaphorical dark veil is lies. Because, because the book is about people lying about stuff. 
the Zari are lying about who they are and what they're doing. The Romulans, some of them are lying about stuff. The Federation aren't being really clear and true about stuff. It's like a lot of it's, it's like everybody's putting a veil up and they're showing people that and they're not showing the, the other people around them what they're really thinking and feeling. And that cause, that's the cause of the conflict in the story. It's like if people are open and honest with each other in this narrative, things would have gone a lot better. So that's the sort of metaphorical veil in the story. Okay. What's uh, What does the future hold in store then? Uh, you mentioned earlier on you're still involved with other projects on things. You know, are you looking to get back to maybe doing a, an episode plot here and there maybe? Have you got a chance of would getting nice. in on that? That would be nice. Um, unfortunately, these days it's a lot tougher to kind of, you know, cross over and, and, and do the uh, the episodic stuff because the, uh, the, the shows that are produced by smaller teams and the narratives are very, very sort of tightly packed. In the old days when I was pitching for Voyager, because it was more episodic, you could kind of come up with an idea that would be easily slotted in. But it's much more difficult to kind of come up with that kind of thing. Having said that, only a couple of nights ago, I was doodling around. And I came up with a really great idea for an episode of Lower Decks. So, you know, Mike McMahon, if you're out there, call me. But um, but no, at the moment, the I am working on a new Star Trek project with uh, Dave Mack and Dayton Ward. That hasn't been officially announced yet. I would say, you know, keep watching the skies. That will probably, we'll, we'll be talking about that in the late half of the, latter half of the year. Um, other than that, um, a couple of other sort of projects that, again, I'm, I'm, I've got signed lots of non-disclosure agreements, so I'm not allowed mm -hmm. to talk about them. Uh, and I'm also working on the uh, sixth book in my Mark Dane action thriller series, which is a kind of contemporary sort of, sort of um, fast-paced thriller. That's going to be coming out later this year as well. Are you open to any requests at all? <laughs> in what? I can't sing, if that's what you're asking. I'm like, no. Always, always wanted to read the backstory as to how Cisco came about being involved in designing the Defiant. Always wanted to, to read a story about that to the point where I started writing one myself. And it's really hard. Like, writing a story, it's, it's really difficult. It is. <laughs> it's, 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 it's really good fun, but it's really hard. But I really want to find out what that story is. So if you need an idea, then I'm sure me and millions of other people would love to have a story about how Cisco did Designed the Defiant back on Utopia. That's funny. That's funny. I was actually briefly, I was going to, in the frame, to write a story about the Zen Kethi War, which was roughly in the same kind of time period. Um, we talked, this is ages ago now, we talked about doing this as a sort of like, you know, a sort of prequel novel, like one of the Lost Era books that kind of fill in a bit of the, the background. And that would have had, that would have had um, young Ben Sisko and, and Curzon Dax fighting the, uh, fighting the Zen Kethi. And in the end, we decided. I can't remember why we didn't decide to do that. We went. We went in a different direction, and we wrote. We we ended up doing another book. So who knows? I mean, there's you know, there's there's a lot of, of of bits of Star Trek backstory that partially now because because the new shows are kind of continuing the narrative forward. Um, we are also looking back because it means that you, if you do stuff set like earlier in the Star Trek continuity, you don't have to worry about it being contradicted. Hopefully, <laughs> he says, you know, fingers crossed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, we may be seeing more sort of TOS or more um, TNG novels. Um, you know, I would certainly like to read more of them. How many projects, James, do you have on the go at any given time? Sounds like quite a few. Well, usually I, I, I don't I don't do kind of like two jobs on the same day. You know, I, I can't really kind of mentally change gears. You know, it's not like I'll work on I'll do a comic book in the morning and I'll work on a novel in the afternoon. I know other writers who do that. And for me, it's just too difficult. I like to focus on one thing. So I'll pick up a project and I'll just sit down and I'll work from A to B to Z or all the way through, you know, finish the whole thing from from start to finish. But on top of that, I've always got like two or three more projects queued up. The life of being a freelance writer is that you have to have plenty of work. You have to keep on ticking over because, you know, we all have our bills to pay. You know, I, if I don't write, I don't eat. So it's quite, you know, it's as simple as that, really. So I'm always thinking, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm working on I'm working on this project right now, typing away. But in the back of my head, I'm thinking next I'll do this and next I'll do that. So I try to have you know, the next six months of my writing career sketched out at any one time. So I can just jump from one project straight to the other, you know, stop for a holiday or, a, or a, you know, a couple of weekends off here and there in between, but just basically just keep on pushing forward and working. How long does it take to, you know, to, to produce something like this then? Well, it varies. I mean, 
Um, generally, two to three months in the writing. Um, sometimes you can add maybe like another month or so onto that if it's a project that needs a lot of work. It needs to go through a lot of iterations and, uh, you know, you have a lot of um, checks and balances that have to be done. When you're writing an original book, you know, the only person you have to please is yourself because you know, like, who the character is. You invent everything, right? But if you're writing a Star Trek novel, there's a lot of people looking over your shoulder who want to make sure it's done correctly. So, and that's not just the publishers, but that's also the editorial team. And that's also the licensing team at the, um, the license, or in this case, start in Paramount and CBS. So all of these people have to sign off it. So you have to please a lot more people. You have to jump through a lot more hoops. And that takes uh, a lot longer. But generally, the, for me, the, the actual sort of hands-on keyboard, bum in chair, writing away stuff, that's about three months. I'd say, I've said to these guys before, genuinely, I, I really enjoyed watching Picard. Um, but after reading your novel and the other prequel novel, I've, I've rewatched it and I enjoyed it more the second time round, thanks to your novel. So thank you for that because it was it really. It's not a case of it didn't make sense. It just added a lot more depth to the things that were going on in Picard and made a lot of things feel like they're a lot more sense. Especially oh, with Michael that, and Troy. That that's that's exactly what what we aim for as time writers, you know, because the. The, the TV show is the source material, you know, but everything orbits around the outside of it. So the job that we do when we're writing the books is we want to support the TV show. So we, we're trying to enhance the experience, you know. So you you watch that episode, you watch, uh, was it Nepenthe, the episode where Riker and Troy, you know, Riker's making his pizza and what have you. And you can watch that episode and say, well, that was great. You know, I, I want to know more about those characters. You imagine you came to that show, you've never seen Star Trek in your life. You don't know who Riker and Troy are. You don't know anything about their backstory but you like them and you want to know more about them, well, you can pick up the Dark Vale and you can read that story and you can learn more about them. I've actually had um, a couple of people come to me recently and say, you know, I never read any of the Star Trek novels before, but I like Picard, I read the Dark Vale, and now I'm going to go and back and I'm going to start reading the Titan novels because I really enjoyed those characters and I want to read all about their adventures. And I said, that's great. We've got like, you know, a, a dozen Titan novels written by me and, and a bunch of other writers and there's some really great stories there. Go, you know, enjoy it. So that's uh, that's kind of the reason that we do it is we 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 support and enhance we kind of unfold the narrative in these tie-in works and just try and bring more to it. And did you find that um, rewriting the characters from the books you'd already done with the Titan series? Did you find that you were overwriting some of the stuff you've already done? I mean, I've, I've I'm only about halfway through Synthesis, I think it is. I've not read any of the other Titan ones. Uh, I don't know what happened in those books, but yeah, have you found yourself overwriting stuff that you'd previously created? Yeah, kind of. I mean, the way I look at it is is it's a different iteration of those characters and that crew. So. Mm -hmm. The crew of the Titan that you see in the Dark Vale is not the same crew you will see in Synthesis because it's they're two different timelines. Mm. So there is some connectivity. There are some characters you come across from one to the other, but um, it's a, it's just a, a different iteration of the same character. So I didn't feel like I was kind of overwriting them. I just thought I'm doing I'm doing a slightly different version. Yeah, you know, it's like. Um, it's if, if you did a, two different versions of Hamlet on stage, right, it's still the same play. But you could do one one traditional one in modern dress and you tell the story, block it in a completely different way, but you're still telling the same story with the same characters. Fantastic. It was lovely to meet you, James, and thank you. Oh, my pleasure, guys. Yeah, we'll st stay in touch. Thanks for your time, James. Thank you, James. Right. Thank you.